everyone and welcome to um, our hackathon event. My name is Catherine Rooney. I'm the Senior Partnerships Officer at one of the UK government's flagship scholarships, Chevening, and I'll be your MC today. I am very excited to welcome you to this third presentation event um, of our cross scholarship collaboration event. This hackathon has been designed to coincide with the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, COP26, which I imagine if you've made it onto this call, you're aware is happening in Glasgow this November. One of the stated goals for COP26 is collaboration. And in many ways, it's the core goal, the goal that supports all of the other COP26 goals and the fundamental purpose of every COP. It's a recognition that, in the words of COP President Alok Sharma, on climate, the world will succeed or fail as one. It is appropriate then that the HMG Scholarships Climate Hackathon should be a truly collaborative and a truly global event. This is our first ever um, cross scholarships collaborative event with over 130 alumni participating from almost 50 countries and territories worldwide. This has been jointly organised between the three FCDO funded scholarships, CSC, Marshall and Chevening. Of course, one of the objectives of our scholarships is to facilitate global cooperation and build global networks. And that's why it's so great to see networks of our alumni expanding even further by bringing these scholarships together. Before we get started, I want to take this opportunity to thank the scholarships teams at the ACU who have been working together for several months to make this hackathon possible. I also want to thank all of the teams who are participating and for the hard work they've put into their proposals, as well as the advisors who generously donated time to support the teams with guidance throughout the process. Of course, I want to thank our judges for bringing their expertise to the competition and also to all of you in the audience for attending. Uh, I'm personally very excited to hear today's proposals. This is the third day of presentations and so far we've seen incredible work um, that we believe could potentially be really truly impactful. And while only one team today will win the chance um, to, to go on to the final, I hope that all of the proposals we see here today will have a life beyond the hackathon. Um, so now we've had a short introduction, I'll move on to the format of the event. You'll have noticed that we are recording today, so just want to bring that to your attention that this event is being recorded. As I mentioned, over the last two weeks, over 130 alumni and scholars have been participating from three scholarship programmes, working to come up with policy solutions to real time climate issues. The teams had 24 hours over two weeks to collaboratively, co collaboratively come up with the proposals you're going to see today. The policies have been split into four themes al aligned with the COP26 themes. So that's finance and collaboration, which we saw on Tuesday, adaptation, which we saw yesterday, and then today's policies, which are all on the theme of mitigation. Um, I mentioned that we've had expert advisors supporting the teams. Thanks again to their hard work. Today, we're hearing from the mitigation teams and uh, presenting their proposals that encourage um, solutions around mitigation. The format will be that one presenter from each team will have five minutes to prevent their innovative related climate related policy proposal. Um, I will um, interrupt when there's one minute left and um, we'll be keeping strictly to time. Another member of the team will be able to answer questions in the chat box. So I do encourage you to fully engage and um, pop your questions in the chat box during the presentations. You won't be distracting the speaker. We have a panel of uh, four expert judges who will then um, assess and analyze the various presentations. So to introduce our judges today, our first judge is Mr. Alexander Antonenko. Um, Alexander is the head of the Energy Efficiency Unit at the Energy Charter Secretariat, where he previously served as an EE coordinator and acting head. In these roles, he's been responsible for the preparation of an in-depth energy efficiency reviews and monitoring the implementation of the provisions of the Energy Tar Charter Treaty and its protocol on energy efficiency and related environmental aspects. He is, also has coordination activities with the other international organisations working on energy efficiency. 
The participation of Mr. Antonenko in the EU-funded Innergate projects showed his expertise and attention to detail when implementing technical assistance assignments. The successful implementation of more than 30 projects and capacity building activities in nine countries during 2010 to 2016 were formally acknowledged by all beneficiaries in these countries. From 2017 to 2021, Mr. Antonenko was one of the main authors of the in-depth energy efficiency reviews and the development of recommendations for energy efficiency policies of Kyrgyzstan, Montenegro, Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan. One of his recent achievements was the successful assistance of the EU for Energy project on the development of energy efficient law of Azerbaijan. The energy efficiency law was officially adopted by the Parliament of the Republic of Azerbaijan in July 2021. Mr. Antonenko is a 2011 Chevening Scholar. Thanks for joining us. Um, our second judge today is James Corey. Uh, James leads Wilton Park's work on climate, energy and the environment. For 2021, his core focus will be to support the UK's joint presidency of the UN climate negotiations, applying Wilton Park's convening power to challenges in climate diplomacy, green finance, energy policy, adaptation, risk and resilience. Other interests include climate, security and migration, ecosystems and biodiversity, as well as marine policy. James previously spent nearly 10 years advising legislators and senior policymakers on climate and energy policy as part of the Secretariat of Climate Parliament, a global cross-party parliamentary network. Earlier posts of the UN Development Programme and International Crisis Group, amongst other organisations, have provided experience of conflict-affected countries. His regional experience includes Africa, particularly the Francophone West African and Maghreb, as well as Asia, including China and uh, India. Thanks for joining us, James. Um, our third judge today is Niti Nesadurai. Niti is the Director and Regional Coordinator of Climate Action Network Southeast Asia, or CANESA. He represents 21 member organisations in six countries. CANESA is a regional node of Climate Action Network, which is more than 1,500 member organisations in over 130 countries. At the national level, NITI is President of Environment Protection Society Malaysia, or EPSM, an all-volunteer membership-based society which focuses on mainstreaming and implementing environmental sustainability. He has served on its Executive Committee for 38 years. Uh, NITI has been following climate change-related issues since 1989, when the Prepare Preparatory Committee for the United Nations Rio Summit in 1992 were initiated. He's attended the UN Nations the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of Parties, or COPs, from 2000 to 2009 and from 2016 to 2019. And from 2001 to 2009, he served as editor of Cannes' eco publication at the COPs. In 2020, Niti led the preparation of a statement on behalf of CSO constituencies in Southeast Asia, presented to the Intergovernmental ASEAN Working Group on Climate Change. He's also helped oversee two research projects on nationally determined contributions and divestment from fossil fuels, which involved Indonesia, Philippines and Vietnam. Niti is a Chevening alum, a Chevening scholar, apologies. Um, Dr. Hasib MD Irfanula is a biologist turned development facilitator who often introduces himself as a research enthusiast. Over the last two decades, he has developed an interest in an understanding of gov environmental governance, climate change adaption, disaster risk management, technical innovation, poverty alleviation, scholarly communications and research impact, all focusing on the well-being of human and nature. Over the years, Hasib has worked for different international development organisations, academic institutions, donors and the government of Bangladesh in different capacities. Currently an independent consultant, he is also a visiting research fellow of the Centre for Sustainable Development at the University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh in Dhaka. Hasib is passionate about creating, capturing and communicating knowledge, testing and promoting new ideas and facilitating collaboration and network. He and his co-workers have co-authored around 40 journal articles, written, edited, and contributed to more than 45 books and other publications, and written more than 130 articles and thought pieces on a wide range of topics. He's also engaged with several global mentoring programs involving young researchers and professionals. Hasib is a 2001 Commonwealth Scholar. Um, thank you very much to our judges for joining us today. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that um, we have no female representation on our panel today. 
whilst we've had female judges on our other two panels, we were unfortunately unable to meet our own ambitions for gender equality throughout our events. Um, we just wanted to acknowledge this, that it's, um, it's, it's a disappointment to us as well for, for not meeting our ambitions. And it highlights the importance of equality and equity in tackling today's and future global challenges. I suppose the positive message is that the diversity within our hackathon teams reflects the importance that all voices are heard in tackling the climate crisis. Uh, we make a commitment to continue to ensure and to work harder to create networks to foster this. Um, that said, we're very, very grateful to all of our um, judges for joining us today. Okay, now we've done the introductions, we can begin with the main event. Today we have 12 teams presenting from representing more than 15 countries. As I mentioned, there will be one presenter per team and then a second member nominated to answer audience questions posted in the chat box. So please do post your questions. To the speakers, I will come in at one minute to let you know you have one minute remaining. I hope that doesn't distract you from your presentations. And then if we get to the five minute walk moment, I will ask you to, to pause just so we can keep to timekeeping. At the end of the presentations, our judges will be invited to ask one live question. If there are additional questions from the judges, then we encourage the judges to pop those into the chat box where the team will be able to respond to them. So to get started, our first team today is Team Urja. They're a team made up of three Chevening alumni, uh, all from India. Our presenter will be Syed Subair Shah, and answering questions in the chat box will be Shijoy Varagese. So over to you, Team Urja. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, hello and good evening from India. We are Team Urja. Well, Urja means energy in its physical form, and it signifies the problem we are trying to solve, which is climate change mitigation through sustainable access to energy by using green hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we have identified two problems that we are trying to solve through our proposed model. Number one, high carbon footprint of hydrogen production in India, because currently it's being produced using, using natural gas. And number two is that high renewable energy penetration results in higher ramping requirements of power during peak load hours. So let me explain this statement from the diagram as shown in the slide, which is uh, known as the duck curve, uh, evident from its shape. Uh, so duck curve in its simplest form is a demand supply mismatch. Basically when the sun is shining, solar power floods the market and it drops off as electricity demand peaks in the evening. So in other words, the power has to be quickly ramped up during the evening hours. So uh, we are proposing to solve these two challenges through green hydrogen production. Although these two problems might look different from each other on their face value, but through green hydrogen production, we have attempted to link the two and provide a common solution. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we propose an optimization model where we determine the 24 hours schedule of green hydrogen production from electrolyzers using surplus renewable energy. So in other words, we propose electrolyzers as demand response agents, which the system operator, whether it's a DSO or an ISO, can use judiciously for meeting the power ramping requirements. So uh, in simple terms, what we suggest is that the belly of the duck in the duck curve is being filled using the electrolyzers as a load. Well, this particular solution is workable when a high number of electrolyzers are uh, connected to the grid. So basically a high penetration of electrolyzers is possible only when green hydrogen production is commercially competitive with gray hydrogen or blue hydrogen. And to achieve the break even point between the two, we need to address three challenges essentially, which are you know tabulated uh, in the table. Uh, they are production, transportation and storage. So if we talk about production from an Indian perspective, the cost of renewable energy in India is one of the lowest in the world, which is highly favorable for reducing the cost of green hydrogen production. Uh, then electrolyzers are capex intensive equipments basically, and they might require government support, uh, and which I'll explain later in slide number five. Then if we talk about transportation, high transportation cost can be taken care of by installing electrolyzers closer to the consumption sites basically the hydrogen intensive industries like the steel or fertilizers etc so in other words we are suggesting we are proposing a shipping green energy rather than shipping green hydrogen and this particular idea is actually facilitated by a robust condition free transmission network in india 
Then if we talk about storage, since we are proposing installation of high electrolyzers closer to the consumption sites, closer to the industries, the existing storage facilities for gray or blue hydrogen can be used for the storage of green hydrogen as well. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, talking about the impact. So uh, our proposed solution has multiple impacts on uh, on reducing the carbon footprint. First of all, green hydrogen in itself is a clean source of energy, which clearly reduces the carbon footprint. And second, it acts as an enabler for higher renewable integration into the into the system. So basically, uh, uh, it has a dual impact and effectively, effectively it reduces the carbon footprint. Yeah, next slide, please. So uh, we have two major stakeholders that are required for implementing our solution. Number one is the government. So uh, till the time we achieve the economies of scale, uh, implementation of electro electrolyzers will require support from the government in the form of capital subsidies in the short term and performance linked incentives in the long run. One minute also, introduce, also introducing zero emission credits for incentivizing the developers, promoting domestic manufacturing of electrolyzers in India for cost reduction. Also, if we talk about the developers, the success of hydrogen economy is largely dependent on developers and investors in this segment. So renewable energy developers investing in electrolyzers can have back-to-back -back power purchase agreements, and this can be seen as an innovative solution. Why? Because this will mitigate their risk on investment and ensure a higher capacity utilization of the renewable energy plant. So uh, we have analyzed our solution on the PEST and SMART matrices. It is perfectly aligned with National Hydrogen Mission of India 2021. Also, the problem posed by the India's renewable energy future because of the duck curve has been publicly acknowledged by the government. Therefore, both the problems that our solution is trying to address are aligned with the priorities of the political executive in India. Another major challenge faced by the existing approaches to green hydrogen production is the financial viability. Uh, our proposal seeks to radically lower the production, uh, radically reduce the production cost of uh, the green hydrogen, thereby making it viable. So, uh, analyzing all the uh, matrices, we can say that our our model is scalable, accessible, and implementable. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Saeed. What a great start. And thanks very much for excellent timekeeping. You've set the bar. Um, I think we have our first question from a judge. So James, we'll go to you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Thank you, James. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks so much for, for having me. Thanks to, to all the teams for all your hard work. Um, it's great that the distinction between grey and green hydrogen is becoming much more widely understood and that and I think the idea of using surplus renewable production is a great one but I must admit I'm still a bit of a skeptic about the large-scale use of hydrogen in general so to focus on the Indian context if these hydrologists hydrolysis plants are going to be connected to the grid sure you're going to make sure that the power you're buying in via your power purchase agreements is from renewable sources but as you scale up production in a country like india that's already had it has huge projected growth in demand for power over the coming decades isn't hydrogen production at scale and eventually just going to increase the pressure on the grid and thereby push back even further the date when we're finally able to stop burning coal for power so so yes by all means, let's replace any grey carbon that's that's currently being produced with green, uh, sorry, grey hydrogen with green hydrogen using surplus renewables. But given that one of the factors we're considering here is scalability, I suppose my question is, can we really afford to produce hydrogen at scale? Wouldn't it be more efficient to electrify sectors like transportation that might otherwise use hydrogen? How scalable is this idea? Yeah, thanks, James, for the question. So uh, as far as India is concerned, I mean, uh, uh, the uh, India has a highly ambitious target of in integrating almost 450 gigawatt of renewable energy into its grid by 2030. And as of date, we have only integrated almost 100 gigawatts. So the, uh, basically, there is a, a, a in the years to come, uh, we are going to see a huge penetration of renewables into the system. And uh, basically, that means that we have ample amount of renewable power in the system. And uh, we can actually afford to integrate more and more uh, uh, electrolyzers into the, into the system. And it, when talking about the economies of scale, I mean, uh, 
as uh, as the, as more and more electrolyzers are added to the system i think equally uh, the uh, renewable uh, the, uh, the installed capacity of the renewable uh, will have gone up by that time equally and i don't think there will be any uh, additional load that the system operator will have to handle uh, and of course yeah you are right i mean uh, when we talk about electrifying the transport uh, the transport has the added advantage of v2g i mean the, uh, the 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 batteries by definition can act as you know both the source and the sink which is not the case with green, green hydrogen but uh, given the fact that the uh, amount of industrial hydrogen the gray or the blue uh, it has a very huge carbon footprint so i think investing in the uh, electrolyzers is actually uh, definitely a viable solution and like we have already proposed in our model that uh, uh, as of now the uh, renewable energy developers have this issue that uh, because of their intermittency or because of their variability they are having a, they're struggling to have long term power purchase agreements with the consumers so if if we if we uh, incentivize them uh, the re developers to uh, to install the electrolyzers itself uh, they can have uh, the back to back arrangements uh, like between the electrolyzer and the re developer thereby mitigating their risk and we can actually ensure that more and more renewable is added into the system so i hope i have answered the question thanks very much said and james for a very um challenging question to get started, set in the tone. Um, I notice there's also a couple of questions that are coming into the chat box. So team Uruja, please do continue to answer there. And thank you very much for your presentation. We will now move on to our second yeah, team. Thank you. thank you. We'll now move on to our second team. This is decarbonizing construction from the ground up. The team is from Uruguay and is made up of three Chevening alumni. The presenter today will be Agustin Dieste and answering questions in the chat box will be Federico Vaz. So over to you. Hello, thank you. My name is Agustin Dieste and I represent team decarbonizing construction from the ground up from Uruguay. Next slide, please. For this hackathon and within the mitigation goal, we identified the challenge of decarbonizing the construction sector. Construction and the running of the built environment account for 39% of carbon emissions globally. Therefore, policy innovations that contribute to decarbonizing these industries can significantly contribute to a concerted effort across industrial sectors. Countries like Uruguay, where traditional building methods are carbon intensive, have the opportunity to further develop a value chain of forestry products that supply the world with biological material alternatives that will store carbon away from the atmosphere within the built environment. However, whereas Uruguay's paper pulp industrial chain has been developing and is now in full operation and expansion, the sawn timber industry has seen a significantly slower development. Next slide, please. To address this challenge, we devised the Affordable Sustainable Housing Program, PAVS for its acronym in Spanish, a policy proposal that looks at incentivizing the demand and supply of housing solutions that make intensive use of construction materials and components based on sustainably managed sources. For this policy, Uruguay's government, who is typically a major actor in any substantial transformation given the internal market size, will implement a carbon emission framework to evaluate new planning applications and grant progressive corporate income tax breaks to developers. In the same vein, it will set up assessment mechanisms for wood intensive projects and fast track their approval. To increase the demand, the government will also establish a set of financial products targeted to first time home buyers. On the one hand, a novel equity scheme will enable purchasers to buy specific new build, new build homes from registered home builders whose developments rank over a, th a threshold in the carbon emission framework. The state will then buy a share between 30 and 70% of the new homes. So purchasers will pay a mortgage on the share they own and a below market value rent on the remainder to the National Mortgage Bank. On the other hand, the National Mortgage Bank will offer special savings accounts allowing prospective buyers to save towards their deposits by investing in the local forestry sector. Besides extending the state's stake in the initial stages of the value and supply chain of the local forestry industry, it will help absorb part of the fiscal waiver granted to developers through corporate income tax breaks. Next slide, please. We expect the policy impacts to be manifold. In particular, we aim to first accelerate the transition of the construction industry to a material supply chain that favors carbon negative materials. 
thus cutting on an increasingly significant share of the 39% of carbon emissions associated to the built environment. Secondly, stimulating the forestry sector development by increased demand for its high added value products, of which currently nearly 50% of the solid wood exported from Uruguay leaves the country with little to no added value as round wood. Thirdly, we aim at developing the creation of jobs by adding links in the value chain of biomaterials. And lastly, our policy will contribute to the provision of the 60 to 70,000 homes currently needed in Uruguay, whilst prioritizing first time buyers who often struggle to raise capital for an upfront down payment. Next slide, please. We understand that it is an advantage that Uruguay is a country where clear rules and institutional stability where many of the bureaucratic infra infrastructures to implement this program are already in place. That being said, to make this policy a reality, the government, working closely with existing state, private, and civil society stake stakeholders, will need to define and operational operationalize the Construction Carbon Emission Framework, CCEF. One minute remaining. Thank you. For this, a dedicated agency may need to be set up. Likewise, a process to assess and rate new planning applications in accordance with their embodied carbon credentials will need to be developed. A communication strategy will need to be set up to inform developers of the potential progressive benefits associated with obtaining high ratings in their planning applications against the construction carbon emissions framework. Finally, the National Mortgage Bank and National Housing Agency, jointly with other public and private stakeholders, will need to further develop, develop the financial instru instrument to launch the shared equity scheme and forestry saving accounts for first-time home buyers. Correspondingly, a communications campaign will need to be set up to promote the benefits to the public. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'll be happy to take questions from the panel. Thanks very much, Agustin. Another um, great presentation and fantastic timekeeping. So thanks very much. Um, we have a question um, from Sasha. Over to you. Um, thank you, the team. Thank you, Agustin, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I have a quick question. You know, just I'm well, uh, you know, just informed about the energy efficiency in houses, and I'm also the uh, passive house energy consultant. So therefore, you know, just and the, I clearly understand the point of reducing the carbon footprint of the construction materials and the construction of new houses. However, you know, just this is only the some part of all of the total, you know, just during the lifetime of a house. This is only, you know, just not that significant part of uh, the energy consumption of the house. So therefore, you know, just my question is, I did not see the proposal of the minimum energy performance requirements for those houses, how energy efficient those houses proposed that to be built within the program should be. So, and maybe you can also answer, you know, just in a way how your policy proposal targets the improvement of not during the construction uh, or the improvement of energy efficiency of those, uh, uh, project or the proposals and the reduction not only the carbon footprint during the construction but only also during the exploitation of those buildings over the next 50 years for example thank you yes thank you very pertinent question and uh, the reason we uh, may have omitted that and and it could be a, a good suggestion to to implement uh, further steps in uh, ensuring the, the in the lifespan of the buildings the operational carbon is also kept to a minimum and, and reduced. Um, however, we focused our attention in the embedded carbon because it's um, usually um, in many countries and certainly in Uruguay absent from the regulations where operational carbon and already targets into uh, improving the U value, for, for example, of, of the built uh, envelope are already in place and those could be made of course uh, progressively tighter in the future but there was currently no policy in place to um, reduce the embedded carbon and um, this could help uh, develop this uh, forestry sector into planting more trees and you know uh, further creating a, a, a virtuous circle of, of, of innovation there so it, it will be a welcome addition to maybe ensure ensure that um, these solutions that are built under the scheme are um, also very efficient, which is also um, easier to do in, in, in wood intensive buildings to uh, have a, a 
high, highly insulated envelope, easier than um, with other construction methods that include more concrete or steel that have higher um, conductiveness of, of heat. So thermal loss is harder to control. So um, it can be done and, and it will be a, a welcome addition to, to, a, to our policy proposal, yes. Thanks very much. Um, and I, again, I think there are some questions coming in on the chat. So I look forward to seeing a bit more about your policy in depth. Thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. Okay, we will move over to our third group. Um, this is Carbon Killers, a group made up of Chevening and CSC alumni, um, correct me if I'm wrong, from Pakistan, Egypt and Russia, but presenting on a topic based on the European region. The presenter will be Yasir Tara, and answering questions in the chat, we have Nihal Munir, Munir Daraj. Um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Catherine. So um, I'll present on, on behalf of my team and our policy is called ETS Plus, which is inspired by the European trading emission system. Uh, next slide, please. So as we speak, two global trends are on a constant rise, global temperature and global population. With an estimated 10 billion people living on Earth by the next decade, no logical scenario can neglect fossil fuels in the future energy mix. And realizing this as a ground reality, one of our biggest challenges right now in Europe is how to transition and how to meet the ambitious Green Deal and Fit for 55 targets. We believe that our best shot at limiting global warming is carbon capture and storage. But the problem with CCS is that it does not generate any money in its value chain. So this raises a big question. Who finances these mega projects? Is it public, is it private investors, or is it something else? Next slide, please. To answer these questions and enable the circular carbon economy where CCUS is a key pillar, our first solution is modifying the current EU ETS, European Union Emission Trading System, in a way that institutions are able to directly finance CCS projects at any stage of the value chain, rather than buying the emission allowances from other installations. This would require an established infrastructure for CCS and a high but one-time investment into the development of the facilities. And to de-risk the initial investment and provide security, we propose three different funding routes. The first is the EU Innovation Fund, which should have a fixed quota for the CCS projects. The second is the government funding proportional to the historical emissions of each country since the pre-industrial levels. And the, and the third is the subsidies in form of tax credits for private investors and companies, a model very much similar to 45Q in the United States. Obviously, collaboration within a multi-industry hub will also allow companies to avoid high upfront costs associated with creating standalone CO2 transport and storage projects. Next slide, please. Removing CO2 from the environment will not only help us achieve our climate change targets, but allow us to utilize cheaper energy sources through the transition period. If not for CCS, industries such as cement, steel, and aviation will either have to shut down due to the high carbon levels or pay heavy fines, which will reflect in inflating commodity prices. On the other hand, once this market is well established and the infrastructure is already scaled up, it will attract more and more industries to be part of the value chain rather than paying fines or investing huge sums of money to move the operations outside the European Union, therefore preventing carbon leakage. Last, in our opinion, such a marketplace in the European Union can provide a huge space for tech and innovation research and cost competitiveness, which can bring the cost of CCS down in future. And we believe such a marketplace can lead to a lower cost of storing a ton of carbon dioxide into the ground rather than buying it from the emission, uh, for the emissions allowances. Next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier, the ETS Plus is a modification to the current emission trading system. And to give an example, uh, I'll show you an animation. So imagine, could you go back a, a click, please? Oh, yeah, uh, just one more click, thank you. So yeah, one more click, please. So yeah, imagine we have an installation A and installation B, both having the same amount of emission allowances. But somehow installation A was able to reduce their emissions. In the current scenario, installation B can buy these allowances from, from installation A by paying a carbon price. And the problem is that even though A reduced their emissions, B was able to increase it because of the trading, which is why the CO2 emissions were not reduced at all, uh, overall. In our model, what we suggest is that instead of buying these allowances from installation A, installation B should invest that amount of money into storing and capturing and storing carbon under the ground. This model provides the clientele for scaling up the CCS infrastructure funded by the Innovation Fund, governments, and subsidies that, we, that I already talked about previously. 
We also realized that implementing this in every European country might be a challenge simply because of the lack of storage sites and the expertise, which is why we believe cross-border transportation such as the one in London protocol should be upheld. And the policy must be implemented in two phases. The first phase is where more developed countries, countries which already have an oil and gas infrastructure where they can store the carbon under the ground, such as UK, Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway, can adopt this model, look at the lessons learned. And since we already talked about cross-border transportation agreements, we also want to promote countries which do not have this infrastructure to transport their CO2 to these countries where, where it can be stored. And once we have this experience in the phase one with early adopters, one minute then, remaining. Thank you. We can then scale it up to phase two, where the other countries in the region can also adopt this, this framework of uh, ETS plus that we suggested. Overall, CCS has a huge potential to decarbonize Europe, and it is one of the only technologies available which actively removes carbon dioxide from the environment. Uh, and with the innovation and development already present in the European region, we believe that Europe can be a role model for adopting this policy and then be a role model for the entire world to follow. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yasser. Um, our first animation of the day. <laughs> um, I'll hand over to the judges. Great, Nuti has uh, his hand up. Nuti, over to you. Hi, Yasser. I've been uh, following developments on CCS uh, for more than 20 years now. And um, in my opinion, uh, there is still uh, no uh, practical, uh, cost-effective implemented model uh, in the world at present. So it, it's, it's a technology which is talked about a lot, yet you see even the oil and gas companies at the height of, you know, when the height of the cost <laughs> of oil uh, tried and shunned away from it, you know. So when you're looking, when you're looking, when you're offering it as a solution to the weaknesses in the ETS, um, are you, uh, I will put it to you that what you're offering is a, an expensive, uh, high technology, um, not practically implementable solution. And therefore, wouldn't it be easier if, if, if the problem is that uh, companies are buying allowances so that they can emit more carbon, close that loophole and don't allow them to buy allowances and ask down to, to zero emissions where they are. Uh, wouldn't that be a simpler option than going into the CCS technology, uh, which is at the end of the day, it's going to be quite expensive. Yeah, so thank you for your question. And I'll agree with a part of your question and I'll disagree with the rest. So I'll, I'll answer it in three, three, uh, three prongs. So first one is the need for the fossil fuel. And a lot of industries currently cannot further lower their emissions, such as steel, cement. And with an overpopulation, the, population, the way the population is increasing, these industries will, will have to, if they want to function, they will need fossil fuels, right? With that being said, CCS, yes, it is a new technology, it's expensive, which is why we also realized in our first slide that financing these projects is a big challenge. However, if you look in Europe, especially because we're talking about European region, if you go to Norway or if you look at Denmark, there are already projects which are investing a lot of money and a lot of carbon directly into the ground. So projects like Northern Lights, projects like Green Sands in Denmark, uh, or Humber project in UK. So, so these things are not really a far-fetched reality anymore. Things are happening. And the reason why companies feel that investing, investing money into CCS is, is better than buying an allowance is because right now the carbon price at, in the allowance system is at 70 or $80 a, a ton of carbon. And the cost of CCS is at 100 or $110 a ton of carbon storage, right? And if we are able to balance this mismatch between the two prices, no company would want to buy an allowance if they already have an infrastructure where they can directly pump their carbon into a pipeline goes into the goes to the ground and this is exactly why we suggested to modify the ets because we we realized that we don't have enough funds for these projects so someone has to pay for it and instead of paying it to the innovation fund why not pay it to a company that can directly store the carbon under the ground so it, it's kind of like a circular loop where 
uh, where we believe that at least until 2030 or 2050, it's impossible to remove the use of fossil fuels and impossible to remove the emissions of carbon dioxide into the environment. But what we can do is be counteractive and store it back or remove it from the environment. So it's kind of like a circular loop with a lot of challenges, yes, but I believe being ambitious is how we'll meet our ambitious targets. Fantastic. Another grueling question from our judges and, and handled excellently. Thanks so much to your presentation for your presentation, you. Yasser and the team. Okay, our next team is oops, sorry, I've just lost my mouse. Um, our next team is Imaged. Um, incentives for mitigating agricultural greenhouse gas emissions with data. Uh, it's a team made up of two Marshall alumni from the USA, as by the nature of the Marshall Scholarship. Um, our presenter will be Anjali Tripathi, and answering questions in the chat will be Yun William Yu. Over to you. I'm excited to share a team image solution that takes advantage of the latest technology from air and space for an opportunity for immediate mitigation uh, for one of the biggest problems um, that we don't discuss. Next slide, please. And so the challenge here is that unlike CO2, methane is actually the second most powerful greenhouse gas with about 85 times uh, the warming potential. It accounts for about 0.5 degrees C since uh, the industrial revolution. But within this, about half of all anthropogenic methane comes from agriculture. And within that, maybe another half comes from um, livestock and especially, you know, we come from the United States where we have these industrialized concentrated animal feeding operations that actually emit quite a bit of methane. But the emissions from this source are often not targeted um, in part because the data on who is emitting is unknown. Um, and moreover, there isn't the same financial incentives as in oil and gas, where you might have a leaky pipeline where you actually want to stop that to preserve profit. Here, it doesn't have that same incentive. And so we want to shift to policies that make that possible. Next, please. And so what we offer is a three-tiered solution that will help reduce methane emissions from agriculture, specifically in the industrialized nations um, of livestock. And so this is based on a foundation of making new data systems um, part of the solution because there are a suite of satellites that are coming online now and in the near term who are going to make a lot of this visible down to the individual farm scale. So making that data more available and providing an infrastructure will be the foundation for then helping our producers to be aware of their emissions. Um, in level two, we actually want to offer responsible producers a way to recognize their low emissions work. Um, by having a seal, just like you have organics or fair trade, but for low methane emissions, it also offers consumers an opportunity to vote with their feet and economically support those um, emissions mitigations efforts. But at level three, we actually want to expand this to all producers and get the remainder who might otherwise not be driven to participate in certification. And so this really is to have a data-driven approach to agricultural subsidies and other agricultural policy. Next slide, please. Because the goal um, of doing this is ultimately mitigation. And we found that when NASA did a study of the state of California, about 60% of emissions came from just 10% of super emitters, including dairies. And what this means is that you have an immense opportunity by letting them know um, of their emissions to actually stop that, which is what NASA found. And so we find that our proposal when we calculate it, we'll actually contribute roughly 5% uh, methane emissions reductions just from the US and EU livestock production alone. So that 5% is one sixth of the way towards the recent global methane pledge, which was um, the US and EU and about 20 other signatories have pledged to reduce methane by 30% by 2030, which would result in about 0.2 degrees C reduction by 2050. So the fact that we can contribute one sixth of that and it can be done immediately as NASA has found is rather remarkable um, because our solution really involves both the producers having the opportunity to focus on that emissions reductions and the consumers to choose. But we're of course really excited about the opportunities to support vulnerable communities. This will improve public health for all with you know, lower asthma and methane issues, but also for agricultural labor. One minute remaining. Lost. 
um, and it makes the data available for all to take more action and policy. Next, please. And so we actually, as a team, are ready to start writing this up using that NASA data you can see from the state of California at the right. Um, and we want to project out more specifically what those numbers would look like, but also what the sectors in the agriculture could benefit from, because we want to help the agricultural trade groups create this low methane certification. So rather than coming from the government first, we want the trade groups to be excited about this responsible option. Um, and so once we've built up that partnership engagement, we're hoping that their push um, together with the government's excitement can leverage all of these new satellites coming on board um, to really make this possible because this is an immediate opportunity for mitigation. So with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you very much, Anjali there. Um, really interesting presentation. Great to see some real data already in the mix. Um, we will hand over to the judges for question. I see James has his hand up. So James, over to you. Thanks, uh, really interesting idea, Anjali. And um, Evan, would you mind just going back to the, the slide, the, the pyramid slide, please? Um, I, I'm just interested in asking you a little bit more about this. I think that you've got an interesting approach to kind of scalability here, where you start with the data and then you you have a kind of, if I've understood correctly, the level you know, level two is a kind of voluntary phase based on certification. But I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the third stage, level three. Um, are, are you envisaging a, a move to, to, to kind of mandatory standards at that point? Um, ideally, it would become mandatory at that phase because, again, one of the um, driving forces when we think about our region, right, because, you know, the US and EU agricultural subsidies are such a big part of what shapes the factors um, that govern what is grown. For example, we have a lot of corn subsidies in the United States, but corn is largely used for feeding livestock, right? It's not that it's a direct subsidy one to one, um, although we do also have that for things like dairy. And so what we would love to see, though, is that right now those are quite divorced from a lot of environmental focus um, that we'd really like to marry them together with the data. Because when you think about even how we estimate how much crops we have in the US right now, we actually have people making phone calls to farmers and going into fields and counting. It doesn't take advantage of all of the opportunities there are from the air and space. And so if that's even just in estimating the output, when we go back up the chain to, you know, insurance protection programs and these other subsidies that we have, there's just that missing link. And so what we want to do is put this together, but by having that voluntary opt-in period from level two, it means that you're going to have producers who will be excited about this, we hope, um, because you know you have arguments for veganism and other things, and this is actually much more palatable, um, that they will then get on board of trying to incentivize this as well. So it is meant to address everyone. Thanks. There's an interesting parallel to, to what's to the conversation in the UK about what, what the post Brexit agricultural subsidy regime looks like. So they're very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, no more cap. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, great presentation. Thank you very much. There are questions coming in to the chat, so do pick those up. Okay, our next team is called Food Loop. It's a team of seven uh, Chevening alumni from Southeast Asia, particularly Malaysia and Philippines. Our presenter will be Edward Bermido and answering questions in the chat, we have Chin Lee Jin. Over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Food connects us all. It is a basic need. It is a part of our identity and culture and a way of socializing with other people. We all love food, don't we? But oftentimes we don't, we are not aware on the emissions of getting the food into our plate and how much of the food in the system is lost and wasted. If global food waste is a country, it would be the third largest producer of greenhouse gas emission. On behalf of Team Food Loop from Malaysia and the Philippines, I will present a policy proposal that can help us eat our way out of climate change. Next slide. In Malaysia, solid waste disposal is the second largest emitter of methane, and agriculture is the largest emitter of nitrous oxide, which accounts for 14,000 gigagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent of untapped avoidance potential. This is already comparable to the total avoidance from national mitigation actions, excluding forestry in 2016, 
which was around 20,000 giga gigagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent. We identified three major pain points in the system. First is the disconnection to food system. People tend to shop in bulk, which ends up in food getting thrown away. Most people are also not aware on the footprint of their food. Second is logistical challenges. Food producers face logistical challenge in expanding their farm sustainably. Globally, one third of the food produced is lost before even reaching the consumers. Third is the opacity of the system. Government and private sectors face this roadblock in reducing systems emission. With this, sustainable alternatives remain expensive and unscalable. Next slide. In order to address the emission and pain points in the system, our team proposes the national food policy emphasizing food systems rather than focusing on individual sectors. We looked into the overall food systems and not just in silos, so the systems thinking approach makes our policy proposal inventive, innovative, and I would say appetizing. First, we want to connect emotionally through food stories and culture. This would enable people to understand their food behavior. Second is overcoming data barriers for food systems. This would eliminate the roadblock for government and private sectors in reducing systems emission. Third is food waste diversion with circular strategies. Whether at the upstream supply chain or in the community, this would ensure that we make the most out of the available food to meet societal needs. And lastly is the recovery of idle and degraded agriculture soil to regenerative practices. This would demonstrate that sequestration could be done at scale. Next slide. Our proposed national policy could result to net positive impact on climate and SDGs. We believe that mitigation isn't just about net zero, it's about net positive. Based on data in Malaysia alone, the mitigation impact potential could be at least 14,000 gigagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent of emission avoidance and the potential food waste diversion of 17,000 tons per day. The policy can also result to higher self-sufficiency, food security, reduced malnutrition, reduced water consumption, net inflow of investment and jobs creation. The impact can also be extended beyond Malaysia. The policy can be implemented yet localized in other developing countries such as the Philippines. Next slide. Using Malaysia as the case study, the implementation mandate for the proposed policy will be from the Economic Planning Unit and the Ministry of Finance. This would be the key to move the states into cohesive action. The key ministries with One high minute, influence minute. on the proposed policy are the Ministry of Health, Agriculture, International Trade, Domestic Trade, and Tourism. We envision that the policy could extend beyond this hackathon, so the adoption could be in 2022 with several reviews thereafter, and the policy review will be conducted in 2040 to evaluate the relevance of the policy. Next slide. To conclude, compartmentalizing climate change responses was previously not successful. Hence, broader policies that integrate social impacts such as our national food policy is crucial. We invite you to partake with us and together let us eat our way out of climate change. Thank you. I'll be Thank glad you. to answer some questions. Great. Thanks, Edward. Another wonderful presentation. Um, Judges, do we have a question? I think we haven't heard from up oh, uh, yet. I was going to say we haven't heard yet from Hasib if, if Hasib wants a chance this time, or if not, James, then Hasib, speak now or hold your peace. Okay, over to you, James. Thanks. Thanks, but also looking forward to hearing from Hasib. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I, I like the, the, the kind of systems based approach. That's really interesting. And um, I, I don't feel like we've heard very much yet about what makes it a national policy. How is it enforced? So you know, it's a national policy in the sense that you're suggesting this is something that's driven by government. But how does how does government drive this? Is it via legislation or incentives or subsidies, engagement with the private sector? How, in what way is government is the government of Malaysia going to make this happen?
Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, Edward. Yeah, I, I wasn't able to get um, all the details of the question from James, but I think I, I was able to get the gist to, to give a response. Um, if I may request to go back to the implementation slide. Yep, this is the one. So based from this, we identified the ministry in Malaysia with the high influence. We map them all in terms of high influence and uh, interest on the proposed policy. So to answer to the question whether what kind of support um, would be needed uh, to, to, to make this national policy a realization, one of them would be um, finance from the economic planning unit and the Ministry of Finance. We uh, believe that finance would be the key, as, as I've mentioned, to move the states into cohesive action. So other than the, um, the top um, minist ministries that would support the implementation of the proposed policy, we also identified the sectors in the community that could you know, from bottom top approach that could, um, we, we intend to create an ecosystem um, to support this policy and make it happen. So yeah, like what I've said, um, we are not focusing on individual sectors. So um, we want to to tap and get support from, from different members as well of, of the community and the system as a whole. Thanks very much. Great. Um, a couple of questions coming into the chat there. So um, do pop over there to answer. Thanks for that presentation. Okay, our next group is called Recharge. Thank you. Thank you. Our next team is called Recharge. Um, it's a team made up of Chevening alumni from India and Sri Lanka. Um, presenting today will be Rustam Sengupta and then answering questions is Ashwin Sabapathy. Um, over to you. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Yep. Perfect. Uh, so good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, we're super happy and proud to present our policy intervention for the solution that we think can create a disruptive big change. And uh, our, our solution uh, is obviously made out of the team, which has come from both policy advisors, practitioners, as well as financial experts. So I'll jump straight in. Next slide, please. The challenge that we are address, addressing is not difficult to understand, and it's not a solution that's not being proposed. We all know that electrification of transportation is going to give us the biggest shift in the needle towards fighting climate change. And in a country like India with a population of nearly a billion and a half right now in that whole region, uh, that is what we need to do. But the problem here is that all the policy support right now, and the, even some of the great government policies are focused more on the urban areas. While if you look at the trends that's happening for the next 10, 15 years, most of the real demand would come from the rural areas, the hinterlands, the tier three cities and beyond. But that is where we need the electrification of transportation to happen. And that's where power is unreliable, charging facilities are not theirs, and there's no financial viability to set up these structures. Next slide, please. So our solution is simple. Our solution is something that's already palatable by the policymakers, but there are needs from the policy side. It's a power hub uh, partially charged by solar or renewables where every electric vehicle can come charge itself or be sold or be repaired or be rented out. We are trying to capitalize on the greenification or the electrification of the agricultural sector. Hundreds of different mechanisms, mecha mechanized agricultural uh, vehicles like tractors, threshers, harvesters, which need to get electrified and need a place to come and get charged. So the solution in itself is actually very commercially viable, is waiting to happen in a few years. But the pilots have proven that there's a little bit policy and financial help just required. Next slide, please. The impact will be huge. And that's this is a story we don't really have to explain. It really moves, we did all our calculations and financial modelings from the climate impact, definitely moves the needle on the climate change and provides us a very cheap way of mitigating carbon dioxide. More importantly, it also unlocks the other additional benefits that can happen from electrification of transportation and also from the penetration and acceleration of 
uh, just good quality transportation in terms of healthcare, education, and lots of pilots have already been done. So we're at a good stage. Next slide. So what needs right now is how do we create an ecosystem where we can accelerate this to happen? It's going to happen, but according to our models is probably the policies we have right now, maybe 10, 15 year, uh, years out. So how do we accelerate it? How do we ensure that every rural district in India has an in integrated power hub or a charging hub where electric vehicles and agricultural machines can come and get charged? Four ways. We need a governance policy, and it is already there in the solar sector in India, in NABARD, in other, uh, other ministries. We need that to now look at electric charging and create a nodal agency for charging sensors in rural areas. We need the technical solution to be feasible. We need some government policy which governs the standardization of quality so that all the OEMs and the no different uh, producers come together. And very importantly, we need a financial solution so that entrepreneurs like I was before or anybody else sees an incentive to come and set up a charging station, whether they come in from as an OEM, whether they come in as a big car company, whether they come in as, uh, as a petrol station remaining. which wants to convert or just a simple uh, entrepreneur who wants to co come in, there has to be a financial incentive to do that, a way to ensure that their IRR is maintained. And finally, we need a capacity building infrastructure. We need these charging stations to become a little hub of activity where, uh, where people who come in are trained, where people can maintain these, and this can be something that's sustainable in the last mile. So like I mentioned, none of these are stuff that comes out of the ordinary, and that's why we propose them, because we know that we need to shift the policy support slowly. And all these are different financial and policy mechanisms which have been tried in the renewable energy, but we need to bring them and customize them in the EV charging space for rural India. If we do that, we unlock millions of vehicles uh, getting electrified and really making a big shift. Thank you. Thank you, Istam. Spot on five minutes there. Wonderful. Um, we have a question um, from Haseeb, our judge. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. for a, for a very exciting uh, proposal. But I, 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 uh, uh, I can see the impact. I can see the uh, elements are there. The governance is there. We have piloted it. There are certain sectors. But the things you have proposed, all the five uh, changes, but I can't see that uh, despite knowing all these things, like we, need, we understand that big push is needed, but still uh, don't, don't, don't see it. What is actually lagging behind? Because we know incentive is needed, needed uh, infrastructure is needed, but what, what is going on? I mean, first, first that, first that, that X factor is not there. What do you think? Exactly. Thank you so much. It's a brilliant question. And uh, my visit to Dhaka or Mirpur last time, I could see why we need to electrify electrification when I was stuck in traffic. So uh, it's a great question. And you're, you're absolutely right. From the periphery, it seems that all the individual parts are there and have been tried in different spaces. So for example, there have been interested subsidies which have been tried in renewable energy power plants. There has been loan, uh, loan guarantees which have been tried what I think we need to do right now is consolidate all the effort and trigger the fire. And I think the triggering of the fire is going to happen through agricultural mechanization. So if you move, if you get the incentive for these huge agricultural machine companies to sort of come in and see this from the fact that we, we, they're already like you know 30,000 plus uh, tractors which are sold in India alone every year, if they start seeing an incentive where their last mile support for electrification is policy driven or has a mandate or has a focus, then I think you can really come in. So that our goal over here is to ensure that we actually create this last mile infrastructure, which incentivize these big agricultural mechanization to happen. And to do that, we need to sort of unlock the entrepreneurial capital that is there in places like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka or India where entrepreneurs see an incentive to set up these hubs. And they, in these hubs, you know, they, they, get, they, uh, they are assured by the government that, okay, this land is there and lease for a long time. I don't have to bother about that. I can get a low interest loan, which is for a long term and a low interest. 
I have some interest rate subsidies, which basically means you they can make some kind of an invest, investment, both uh, money and time wise to set it up. But I see this is definitely some, it's a brilliant question because we see this, uh, there, this will happen trickle in over a lo- short period, long period of time. But the real trigger is to get all the parties together and uh, do a very holistic research on what we can get kickstarted on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rustam. Um, seems to be a topic of interest in the chat. So lots of questions there as well. Great. Our next team is called East Africa Green Environment Promoters. Um, two members, no, sorry, four members of both Chibening and CSC alumni from Kenya and Uganda. Over to you. Thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, Catherine. I'm Caroline Chalal. Um, presenting on behalf of my team. And um, just to say that uh, while the world is moving to using uh, sustainable energy sources, there is a group that is being left out. And looking at Africa as a whole, the rural community, which actually forms the bigger part of the, uh, the, the community in Africa, are actually uh, very poor. They are poor and actually majority of them are living below a dollar a day and they are hard to access and they are also not able to access these um, t- types of uh, energy sources. Therefore, they are still using biomass, which is actually uh, the biggest polluter. So we go to the next slide, Catherine. So what is the challenge here? The biggest challenge actually that is uh, being faced in Africa and East Africa is uh, that the the majority of the rural communities uh, live in Kogi, hard to reach and have little access to climate change information. So we are seeing a massive deforestation in this region. And this actually results in a shrinking of the carbon sinks. So uh, women and children are actually impact, more impacted uh, in these uh, climate change issues because they are the ones who rely on ecosystem services for survival. We see that they are going out to seek biomass as a source of domestic energy, and therefore it is uh, in um, exacerbating the impacts of climate change. And as a result of that, there is also um, health complications among this uh, population because of indoor air pollution. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what is our solution here? We also realize that this group, um, uh, they, they are not aware about climate change and they are also not aware of alternative sources of energy. So uh, our solution uh, seeks to embark on creating awareness so that this community or this group of people are enlightened on climate change and also on alternative sources of energy. So we want to also, our policy proposal seeks to initiate a tree planting initiative uh, to act as carbon sinks. And uh, our policy proposal seeks to prioritize on indigenous trees. We realize that indigenous trees takes a longer period to mature. And we are talking of a span of 30 to 50 years. So this will actually help to solve the issue of encroachments into the forest uh, resources. we also want to introduce uh, briquettes as an alternative source of energy. So briquettes actually is a sustainable, clean source of energy that has not been um, taken up because this is a very poor um, group that we are talking about. People living uh, le- less than a dollar a day, they are not able to take up these other sources of energy like solar. And actually, uh, if I t- speak about Kenya, uh, the government of Kenya is trying to... Uh, decarbonize the, the, the system and introduce wind power, but still we are saying that this is not adequate to cover the whole population. And so this is a, a challenge that is being faced throughout East Africa. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the impact? So awareness creation on climate change uh, will result in better decisions and improved adaptations. We realize that if these rural communities Uh, become more aware of climate change, they will be able to make informed decisions. And therefore, we will be able to see uh, improved adaptation to climate change. So uh, if we are able to uh, um, undertake extensive um, tree planting, 
we will realize that we're able to expand our carbon sinks and therefore it will help um, a long way in reducing our CO2 in the atmosphere. So uh, we are also saying that tree planting will also help Kenya to achieve its 10% um, forest cover One target, remaining. which is by 2025. Briquettes will also uh, replace uh, wood as a source of fuel that save women time, which can be used in other productive activities. It will also to safeguard their health by eliminating indoor air pollution. Next slide, please. So implementation, we hope to implement this project in Elgeo Marakwet County with the possibility of scaling it up throughout Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. We hope to undertake awareness creation. Uh, we hope to undertake land cover and land cover change assessments. We want to estimate green, greenhouse gas emissions. We want to set up uh, renewable energy mini plants for making the briquettes and carry out tree planting drives and disseminate our results. Our key stakeholders in this case would be the national government, county governments, local community members, the media, our development partners, research institutions, and private sector players. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, lots to think about there. Any questions from our judges? Yes, Nitty. Hi, Caroline. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, you want to raise awareness on on climate change and there about uh, bring about better practices. I'm just wondering whether that in itself will be enough. Um, and it feels uh, a very top-down approach because in the sense that to bring about change, one really has to engage with stakeholder involvement, engage with the community, and get them to come up with the solutions, including what are the alternative livelihoods or alternative practices. So has this been factored into your plan, whereby you have extensive engagement and consultation with the communities, with the affected communities, as opposed to what maybe someone coming from the outside and trying to tell people what, you know, about climate change and hoping that it inspires them to change. That's uh, one, one clarification I would like from you. Uh, the second one is about this tree planting initiative. Where, uh, maybe you could elaborate on uh, where, uh, who's going to give the land for the trees to be planted on? Uh, who's going to give the advice on the type of trees which should be planted? You did mention native species. And who's going to pay for them and who's going to also look after the maintenance of the trees because many a time when we have big large-scale tree planting the success rate is usually quite low so how do you overcome this uh, possible negative impact over just in um in honor of time and also giving putting each team in the same scenario. Caroline, if you answer one question live, and then um, Nitti, if you wouldn't mind just summarizing the second question in the box and the team can respond to that there. Thanks, over to you, Caroline. Uh, thank you so much for those two questions. So one, uh, your first question uh, is uh, engagement. And uh, this uh, policy proposal will aim to involve the local community. That's our target community. And we have identified various stakeholders as well we hope to collaborate with. Uh, we are aiming at uh, looking, um, dealing with indigenous trees and we have research institutions within the, this community who will help us to actually uh, identify the most resistant uh, tree species. You know, with the changing climate, we are saying that we need to have tree species which are more adaptive and, and can survive the, the harsh conditions. So yes, the local community will be uh, involved in this uh, case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and yet yeah, do um, get on to the second, following up on the second question in the chat box. Fantastic. Um, our next team is called Waresma. Um, it's a team of six Chevening and CSC alumni from Zambia, Uganda, and Nigeria. Speaking today, we have Anietti Williams, and answering questions in the chat box is Linda Amanya. 
over to you. All right, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Anita Williams, and I'm very, very excited to be presenting my team today, speaking on a threefold policy framework for the conversion of food waste to resources in Sub-Saharan Africa. My team name is Waresma, and that's short for Waste Resource Management. Next slide, please. Okay, so first and foremost um, is the challenge. And so what we have done is we have divided the challenge, challenges that we identified into three distinct areas and which are very, very immensely important. The first is the um, food loss, the food loss and waste. Over 37% of food is lost and wasted in Sub-Saharan Africa alone, counting, uh, amounting to almost uh, over 4 billion US dollars. And by our own research, we have seen that this is um, able to feed at least 48 million people. And so when you um, juxtapose this with the fact that in, in Africa alone, um, more than 260 million people are undernourished, then you would agree with me that this is a very, very serious problem. Apart from this, there's also the problem of energy inefficiency. 90% of sub-Saharan Africa's population depend on firewood for cooking, and this amounts to about 1.2% of global carbon dioxide emission, which is really huge, causing biodiversity loss, soil erosion, and land degradation. And so another problem that could arise is what happens with where, how, how are these waste being disposed? So we have inappropriate and illegal dumping of waste leading to a huge large field across Sub-Saharan Africa and greenhouse gas emissions as well. So these are really huge problems. And the next slide, I'll propose our solutions to them. Okay, so uh, what we have tried to do is that we have proposed a, a novel threefold policy framework for utilizing food waste in Sub-Saharan Africa. The first is the use of the measure track initiative effect. And so what we, what we think is first and foremost, waste that are being generated by individuals, companies, households, and all of that should first be uh, measured effectively so that we'll be able to track their source and track how they are being um, um, disposed and discarded. Okay, and then a part of that is action as well. So action involves creating awareness for local people, creating awareness for companies, creating awareness for everyone involved and ensuring that action is being taken. Number two is the provision of financial incentives. We believe that one of the ways to effect change is creating financial incentives in terms of money and tax incentives for individuals, for households and for um, companies to ensure that they are able to stick to um, waste consciousness and sustainability um, perspectives. Number three is bionutrient and energy recovery. What we have done is we are proposing uh, uh, sustainable technologies that could be used to recover um, any waste that, that makes it out. So sustainable technologies like um, hydrothermal uh, carbonization, um, enzymatic degradation, and what have you are, are important technologies that have been implemented across the world, and which we believe if brought into Africa would, um, would go a long way in solving uh, most of these problems. Next slide, please. Okay, so what would be the impact of our work? The impact of our work, we have tried to put it side by side with um, the sustainable development goals. First is increased biodiversity. We believe that if um, most of the food waste that has been generated are used as a source of energy generation using the sustainable technologies I mentioned earlier, then it means that the falling of trees that's being used for firewood and for cooking would reduce dramatically and that will contribute to the sustainable development goal 15. How about zero food waste to landfill by 2030? That's also another very, very important impact of our work. Increase farmers' income because farmers will be able to generate alternative sources of revenue from the um, agricultural waste and food waste that they produce. 15% reduction in the greenhouse gas emission by 2030 as well. And very, very importantly, is the provision of 1 million grid jobs by our estimation, we believe that if some of these sustainable technologies are implemented across sub Saharan Africa, we have calculated that remaining. at least 1 million green jobs would be provided. Next slide, please. Okay, so how will our policy be implemented? Like I said before, the first is the training, awareness, creation, and citizen engagement. For any change to be implemented, we believe that people first have to be aware. A lot of people uh, across sub Saharan Africa are I'm actually in ignorant of their role in, in the climate change propagation. And so we believe that the first thing we're going to be doing is creating awareness and citizen engagement. Secondly, is the creation of partnership with relevant authorities and stakeholders to implement these policies. 
We have identified stakeholders such as investors, food companies, policymakers, environmentalists, environmental regulators, councils, and among others. And so these are the people that we hope to be working with in implementing the change that we intend. Finally, is the use of sustainable technologies, hydrothermal carbonization, enzymatic degradation, which are easily scalable, accessible, and affordable, and can be implemented in local communities across Africa. And we believe that with this, this will create a lot of jobs for local population. So thank you so much for, uh, for listening to our presentation, and we are happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Anieti. Um, over to our judges, is there a question for Team Moresma? Yes, Hasib, over to you. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation. I was just wondering, uh, you have been trying to tackle three different, uh, of course, interconnected uh, challenges. But I was wondering that at the moment, is there any existing body or existing policy that actually bring this together, or we need to develop something new. Because at the first glance, they, they, you might not see the connection. They're all important. And in the last implementation slide, you have shown that all are uh, separate activities. I was just wondering whether there is any policy or a body can bring all together. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Um, we believe that the three of them are really, really interconnected in the sense that if um, food waste are uh, um, recovered as much as possible, um, according to the waste management hierarchy, for example, first and foremost is to prevent food waste, creating awareness to people, creating awareness to households, creating awareness to um, individuals and communities, and letting them know of their roles in um, the mitigation of food waste and all of that. And so if that is uh, properly implemented, then we, uh, then of course that, that first part of our policy has already been tackled. But according to waste management hierarchy, there's also the uh, place of um, energy um, recovery and energy and nutrient recovery, which is also part of the plan. So we believe that not all food waste can actually be prevented. Some of them would also still make it out. And so because of that, we believe that what are the alternative things that we could use this food waste and municipal, municipal waste to achieve. And one of it is in the generation of energy using sustainable technologies. And yeah, we have identified stakeholders such as the Ministry of Environment um, across of Southern Africa, and of course, ministry departments and agencies that are highly relevant and very relevant. And we believe that if um, these plans are um, properly implemented and stick to, then we can actually achieve this. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Team Wesma. And if there are any other questions from the judges or the audience, please do put them in the chat box. Great. Our next team is Team Carbon Busters. It's a team of three Chevening and CSC alumni from Pakistan. Presenting will be Aftab Zafar and answering questions in the chat will be Sana Rasool and Aisha Aruj. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Carbon uh, is something we cannot eliminate, but we can control it. And through this policy proposal, we would be talking about fossil fuel management and the concept of integrated resource recovery of biofuel and plastic recycling management. Uh, we are carbon busters and with me uh, is Sana and Aisha. Uh, thanks to them, we have prepared this proposal. Uh, next slide, please. We talk about three issues. Uh, we talk about carbon, economy, and then the waste management and how is it all connected. Let's first focus on the power generation in Pakistan, which heavily relies on the fossil fuels and currently comprises of 61% of the uh, generation. We are dependent on the fuel inputs and the current oil price increases is acting as a primary contributor to the inflation worsening the economic situation of the country. As we move towards development, our energy mix is an option that we can play with as a country. Secondly, we have tons to 20,000 million tons of agriculture waste and 30 million tons of municipal waste, which is being dumped. So keep that in mind as a challenge as an, and, and as an opportunity. 
Third, we are ranked as 15th in the list of countries with the most mismanaged plastic in the world. Next slide, please. As a team, we thought about to come up with a novel idea of integrated resource recovery to how can we mitigate carbon uh, in aligning with the COP26 and climate hackathon objectives. First of all, we talk about converting the waste plastic into a raw material called plastic lumber. Now we can use this idea to lower the amount of carbon as the plastic is produced by fossil fuels primarily. Secondly, biofuels, which can be generated through bioreactors and digesters using the process of anaerobic digestion and which we can use and lower the carbon by reducing or actually making it as an alternative fuel. Last, we talk about the fossil fuel usage and our idea is to prioritize as a country low carbon fuels, leaving less carbon footprint in the country. Uh, secondly, introducing carbon taxation in Pakistan. And finally, controlling the industrial emissions by making it mandatory for the uh, development and implementation of net, net zero strategies, which align with the global goals. To talk about it in detail, I would request Sana to give us an overview of implementation and the impact of the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aftab. Uh, plastic and pollution, ladies and gentlemen, is a serious problem in Pakistan. Uh, around 30 million people in Pakistan do not have access to clean water due to improper waste management practices. The air quality in many of Pakistan's cities is at least six times worse than what is considered safe by World Health Organization standards. And River Indus, which is one of the main rivers in the country, is among the 10 most polluted rivers in, Pakistan, in the world. A recent government report indicated that around 130,000 people in Pakistan lose their lives to climate change each year. So this idea of the Integrated Resource Recovery Center that Aftab has just explained uh, aims to reduce, reuse, and recycle this waste to prevent pollution problem plaguing Pakistan. We are addressing three uh, sustainable development goals, which include SDG 13 on climate action, SDG 3 on good health and well-being, and SDG 7 on affordable and clean energy. The idea of energy transition that after one minute remaining aims to convert at least half of the fossil fuel plants in the country to coal firing and coal generation by 2050. The implementation strategy uh, of our project on the next slide, please includes the next slide please the implementation strategy includes the development of a think tank uh, for energy related carbon control which collaborates with public and private stakeholders we would also need to gather comprehensive data on plastic waste that's generated in pakistan and the potential for generating biofuel in the country uh, we would need to create uh, the blueprint for an integrated resource recovery center, which includes the designing, implementation, operation, and management of the plant itself. The idea of an IRRC is scalable, and it depends on based characteristics. This type of system is already in operation in two of the cities, Mardan and Islamabad. The plant in Mardan... Sorry, team carbon busters, that's actually time. If you could just summarize in one sentence to close. Sure. So the key stakeholders for this idea will include the local governments, the industries and the municipalities. And that sums up our discussion on the IRRCs. Uh, thank you. And I open the floor to questions, please. Thank you very much. And sorry to have to cut your presentation short there. Um, to our judges, is there a question for Team Carbon Busters? Thanks, James. Over to you. Uh, thanks, both. Interesting proposal. Um, so I, I'm interested to know um, what the projected um, lifespan of the plants is, or more specifically, um, for what periods do they need to, to continue to operate to, um, to pay back the in investment either for retrofitting existing plants or for building new plants? And the, the, the concern, um, with, with this type of project is often that <clears throat> you, 
if if the projected lifespan say is 30 40 50 years uh, of operation does that imply that you have to that that, that society has to keep uh, producing, generating the, the single-use plastic in order to feed the plant to make it economically viable. I'm interested to know how you respond to that. Thank you. Uh, Aftab, uh, will you be taking the question or should I? Uh, Sana, yeah, I think you should take this question. Thank you, James. Thank you for the question. Um, so an interesting point raised by you regarding um, uh, plastic and its generation as a fuel for the IRRC. Um, now, the concept behind the IRRC that we envisioned was to make use of the plastic and the pollution that's already present in the system uh, to come up with reusable and recyclable materials. Um, the idea was not to generate additional plastic. The, the life cycle of the IRRC is from 20 to 30 years, depending on its management, depending on the operations. It is a scalable project. It depends on the waste characteristics. For example, in Merdan, the IRRC that's, opera uh, that's in operation uh, produce, is focused on composting and biofuel generation because the waste has a high level of organic component. Whereas the plant in Islamabad, because of the high level of industrialization, is focused on plastic recycling. So it's scalable and it is also moldable uh, depending on the characteristics of the waste being produced in, in that particular region. I hope that answers your question. Some affirmative nods there from James. Thanks very much for that answer, Sana. And um, great, and lots more questions coming in on the chat box. So do continue that conversation there. Thank you to Team Carbon Busters. Okay, um, our next team is the Guinea Zayama team. It's a team of three Chevening alumni from Guinea. Speaking today will be uh, Aya Saidu Kwande. And answering questions will be Mamadi Kovelele Keita. So over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, my name is Ia, and I'm happy to represent the Guinean Zayama team here. Next slide, please. So um, fast forward, for those who don't know Guinea, Guinea is a West African country with an estimated population of 13.13 million and uh, known for its bauxite uh, as the second world reserve. Well, alongside this gigantic uh, mineral reserve image, we also have uh, uh, a very huge problem of plastic waste management. And according to the Ministry of Environment, uh, almost um, one kilogram uh, of plastic bags are produced per day and per person. You can imagine that. And the worst of it is less than 20% of these uh, plastic bags are reusable. And people have, um, the population have resulted in um, using alternative measures to get rid of these plastic bags. Uh, for instance, burning them in open air with all the environmental consequences, you know, and it's quite uh, often to see in the streets of uh, Conakry, the capital city, uh, plastic bags or garbage is being dumped there. Um, in 2017, just as an example, uh, there was what I would call a garbage slide which killed at least eight people in the city center. So uh, amidst also the darts of uh, information and uh, studies, studies have shown that in 2019, uh, the first cause of uh, death was um, infectious, uh, of, of, was uh, low respiratory um, infections and the fourth one was uh, diarrhea diseases and air pollution being identified as uh, the, first, the, the second risk factor. Clearly there's a problem. And this is what we are about to address. Next slide, please. So our solution lies in, a very, uh, in two phases. The first one is advocating for a legislation on the use of plastic bags. Uh, Guinea is among all uh, uh, the rare West African or Sub-Saharan African countries that have not yet adopted any legislation on the use of plastic bags. And uh, to achieve this, we'll be lobbying at uh, not only at the decision-making level, but mainly at community-based um, level to especially um, gain uh, community um, engagement. And the second leg of our program uh, will be um, developing a behavior
it looks like we've lost Ia there. Um, I'm not sure if another member of the team is perhaps able to step in and pick up the presentation where we were. Oh, is that you back? Hi, <laughs> um, you're on mute, but I paused the clock. Um, so you've got two minutes, 20 seconds left, and we lost you just when you were beginning to introduce the second um, action point, so the developer behavior part. So if you just want to pick up from there, thanks. Yeah, so I was saying the, the second leg of our program is developing a behavior change model, which is trying to um, turn um, challenges to opportunity. That is um, the, the incentive that will be generated from this recycling process, turning them to what we call community health um, insurance projects. This would be absolutely in partnership with um, local health facilities, making sure that the, 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 the benefit we generate from this recycling process to um, uh, make people subscribe to community health program because getting less than 30% of uh, the population has uh, access to public health facilities. Next slide, please. So our stages of implementation, basically, as I said, there's a third of information so we start with generating evidence, scientific evidence to inform not only decision makers, but um, increase more awareness among the, the public. And the second phase will be drafting this policy or, or behavior change model that I've discussed now and, community, and communicating through um, social media and traditional uh, channels such as radio and others. This is also help us uh, gain more community engagement. Furthermore, we'll highlight environmental consequences as well as the health and agricultural consequences of this plastic, of this mismanagement of plastic bags. And finally, we'll um, do more advocacy at a higher level. Through One minute events, remaining. Such as, um, thank you, um, cleaning, regular cleaning days uh, with the help of international organizations and uh, governments. Next slide, please. The impact of our program or project is are obviously enormous. It will help us um, build a better life for our communities, clean environment, create more opportunities, especially in the, the plastic or waste management sector. And above all, it will help promote a special perception of plastic bags in the Guinean community that is transforming um, this challenge of uh, waste management to opportunity. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, congratulations there on picking back up in the middle. I know that can be off-putting and you did a great job to get back on track. Um, we have a question from our judge. Sasha, over to you. Um, thank you, Ian. Thank you for your team, to your team for, you know, just for this proposal. You know, just I've been listening carefully and I can clearly see that you propose to advocate for the legislation on the use of plastic. I can see that you're proposing awareness raising, that you propose, you know, just to have those days and lobbying. But could you maybe just explain briefly, you know, just what exactly, you know, just do you propose with regards to the policy? You know, just what policy measures would you propose, you know, just to deal with this problem? Because uh, We've seen, you know, just number of examples in the country where there is right now the uh, complete ban of pl use of plastic bags in the supermarket and the markets, you know, just maybe, you know, just if you could just a little bit highlight, you know, just what exact policy proposal are you, you know, just targeting and what is the novelty of those policy proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so I was so. so as I said, over 40, 40 countries in sub-Saharan Africa have adopted um, legislations with regarding uh, plastic bag management. But um, from successful models, oh, when I look at Kenya, Uganda, and uh, uh, Rwanda, you see that they have like different models and uh, different reasons why um, some have succeeded and some have not. So in the case of Guinea, what we are suggesting is uh, based on uh, legislation, it, it could either be levies, taxes, or completely banning them, but based it on evidence that we will generate on public acceptance and also minimizing the risk of, because you might say, okay, we're going to ban uh, plastic bags, 
in this country as several other countries in Africa. But at the end, if there is no public acceptance, no uh, community engagement, you're not going to um, um, uh, be successful in what you will be achieving. And then also, you need to have alternative measures. So first of all, we generate, as I said, evidence. And based on the, the, the community perception, to either go with um, levies or um, uh, ban. Hope I answer your question. Thanks very much. Yeah, if there are any follow up questions, do pop those in the chat box, both to the judges and the audience as well. Fantastic. Right, we will move on to our penultimate team. This is, sorry if I pronounce this wrong. E.V. Anders Um, It's a team made up of three Chevening alumni from Morocco, Philippines, and India. Presenting will be Ronaldo Gutierrez, and answering questions in the chat is Abhinav Soman. Over to you. Okay. Uh, good. Good day, everyone. Uh, let me uh, take this opportunity to briefly explain the inspiration for our team name, Anders Science. Uh, it's actually inspired by Robert Anderson uh, from Scotland. He's credited for having invented the first uh, electric vehicle. So we simply tweaked his name to make it more gender inclusive. So next slide, please. So the problem is that according to the International Energy Agency, 25% of greenhouse gas emissions come from the transportation. It's actually the fastest growing sector in absolute terms. Now, a dozen or so countries have actually made commitments beginning 2025 with Norway as the most ambitious to phase out 100% the sale or registration of new vehicles running on internal combustion engines or ICEs. Uh, in layperson's terms, that means running on petrol or uh, gasoline. Uh, this is all good, except that there are 1.4 billion estimated vehicles uh, on the road right now running on petrol. And that usual phase out programs actually uh, pose problems on recycling. Uh, in addition to that, there's also the pro unintended consequence of dumping in developing countries. So uh, we're asking how can the transition to EVs make a dent, especially in developing countries, considering that the earliest uh, commitments coming from developing countries for, uh, for a phase out would begin uh, somewhere, somewhere around 2050. Next slide, please. Our solution is to provide an enabling environment for retrofitting by original equipment manufacturers or OEMs. Our contribution to this whole uh, effort to accelerate the switch to EVs is by introducing the OEMs to the equation. Um, why, why this is so? Because retrofitting is actually an existing technology. It's happening as we speak, except that it's happening at a very small scale, usually a specialist trade involving vintage car owners. By introducing the OEMs into the picture, we can achieve scale, replicability, and accessibility. But for that to happen, we have to have the regulatory and legal environment so that incentives could be put in place uh, to spur the demand, uh, both financial and uh, non-financial uh, non incentives, and also provide support services so that um, both the demand and the supply side of the equation can actually uh, begin. No? Uh, next slide, please. The impact we believe is going to be very significant because it's going to affect the, the, the existing stock of vehicles that are currently producing the greenhouse gases. More than that, it's going to happen a lot earlier than 2030 or 2035. It can happen as we speak. Now, uh, consider also the fact that the, uh, that the an, uh, a vehicle is an average lifespan of between 15 uh, to 18 years. So, even if we, in Norway, they, they banned the new vehicles by 2025, it would take another 15 or 18 years for the last uh, petrol-based fuel to stop emitting uh, 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 greenhouse gases. It will also reduce the challenges to recycling, uh, deter perhaps the problem of dumping, and also reduce the stress on uh, having new, uh, or the demand for raw materials for new cars because we're going to use the same vehicles. It will definitely boost local employment because the retrofitting will be happening where the service centers of each OEM is in your in every country where the cars are. So it's a bit democratized in that sense. And because retrofitting costs less than a brand new vehicle, there will be less subsidies or even perhaps bigger subsidies, except that there are more beneficiaries. It would also mean better health for street workers, uh, like traffic enforcers, street vendors, and everyone, the joggers and the pedestrians, would also mean 
uh, consumer product safety because nobody knows better the technical and design specifications of each car model than the original uh, manufacturers themselves. At the end of the day, it represents more choices because our policy doesn't detract from pursuing a sustainable mass transfer, transportation program. One minute pursuing, remaining. Thank you for uh, pursuing a, um, uh, a phase out. It simply represents another choice that probably would be suitable for one's budget. Next slide, please. For implementation, we need to identify countries and OEMs to champion the policy. Uh, we need to start beginning, to, we need to begin creating awareness of the advantages of EVs and the benefits of retrofitting, particularly because uh, retrofitting can actually pay for itself in the long run, considering the prices of fuel right now. We need to start establishing and expanding the charging infrastructure to reduce range anxiety, which is identified as the big, one of the biggest concerns among consumers, and we can explore community-based charging. We need to start capacity building for future workers on EVs and that to include women. We have to design subsidy programs, elicit broad-based support, and provide certification testing protocols for retrofitted vehicles to make sure that each one that hits the streets is roadworthy. Uh, next slide, please. In conclusion, through this proposal, we hope that we can correct our course toward the green future in transportation that Robert Anderson envisioned for us nearly two centuries ago. Thank you very much. Uh, that ends our presentation. We're open to your questions. Thank you very much, Team Evie and and Sion. Sion, sorry, Science. wrong again. Sion, <laughs> there we go. Thank you. I think we do have a question uh, from Nisi there. We'll hand over to you. Yeah, very quick question, Ron. Uh, one is, what is the enabling policy environment uh, you foresee which would need to facilitate uh, the retrofitting? And, and what, what is the incentive for people to retrofit the cost and the payback period? Why would they want to do it? Okay, well, first of all, um, the enabling uh, policy environment that we want is to have the, the main stakeholders like the autom uh, automotive, uh, automobile industry, the government and the consumers, and also the power industry, of course, um, so that uh, we can sit together and uh, devise ways by which we can uh, wean ourselves from the petrol-based uh, uh, transport industry. Now, uh, this would require the government intervention because unfortunately, the, the industry, uh, automobile industry is uh, locked into this uh, business uh, model wherein all they want is always something new. No? Now, for the consumers, this is actually a, a very attractive proposition because the cost of running an, uh, 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 an EV, a retrofitted EV, is actually a lot cheaper than buying a new one. Even if it's, uh, I mean, even if you can afford it, it's really not available uh, in, especially in developing countries. But uh, for for countries, especially in Southeast Asia, which are locked into some financial plans, so on and so forth, for the next ten to fifteen years, buying a new one is not really an option. But uh, but converting your car into an EV, considering the traffic situation in uh, in many uh, cities in developing countries, um, actually has moved multi-co benefits. No? So from the clean air alone, um, you, can, you, you, you would want to go into retrofitting uh, on top of the fact that uh, people are actually don't know that you, do, you need less maintenance um, from, from uh, the fact that you have less running uh, equipment in, in, uh, in an EV compared to an ICE no? or internal combustion engine. And the cost is actually a lot lower than if you than the current uh, oil prices. So there are plenty of co-benefits that can come aside from the cost and why you would want to retrofit. Thank you for the question. Thanks very much. You can see lots of vintage cars if they're plugged into the electric ports. Um, great, well, we're moving on to our last team. It's hard to believe. Um, this is team Mesopotamia. Um, it's a team from Iraq made up of two Chevening alumni. As this is the last uh, presentation, um, if you do have a question, I suggest trying to get it in as early as possible in the chat so that the team have an answer, have a chance to answer it before we end. So the um, presenter for today is Wasim Alwad and answering questions in the chat box, we have Sharif Koshnor. Um, over to you, Team Mesopotamia. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for the introduction. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank the 
the organizers of this event uh, for giving us the opportunity to present the policy proposal we developed uh, to help mitigate climate change and its impact on the environment and the uh, communities in Iraq. Next. So let me start uh, uh, first with the statistics that show some of the environmental challenges we faced in Iraq over the last 20 years. Uh, we see that the number of fossil fuel cars and its associated CO2 emissions uh, have increased dramatically by five times. Over 7 million cars as of 2020, uh, with over 10 million tons of CO2 per year. Uh, of course, these numbers are expected to almost double by 2030, uh, as per our projections. Uh, on the other hand, a study published by researchers at MIT uh, showed that the mean temperature in Iraq is increasing at double the rate of Earth as a whole. Uh, uh, all this made worse uh, uh, by the destruction of the green areas uh, around and inside the cities with estimated 15% degradation over that period. So while all these challenges may not seem connected to each other as a, uh, at first, uh, uh, we think, however, that all they can have a common solution. Uh, and that solution is reforestation. Next. Uh, reforestation is, is, is a proven to reverse the climate change and offset carbon emissions. And in Iraq, we think it can play a big role to tackle all these challenges altogether. And that's why we are proposing a, a carbon offset fees to be imposed by the government on the usage of fossil fuel cards. Uh, and the collected money goes to fund reforestation projects. Uh, one tree can absorb anywhere between 10 to 15 uh, uh, kilogram of CO2 per year. We did some calculations and we estimated an average of 1.4 ton of CO2 is omitted per year from single car in Iraq. Uh, and to offset these emissions, we need uh, uh, 56 uh, trees per car. So as long as people want to use uh, fossil fuels, uh, they need to compensate for their emissions through reforestation. Next. Uh, there are a lot of uh, evidences available in the scientific uh, literature on the positive impact of reforestation on the environment and how effective it is in eliminating CO2 emissions at lower surface temperature. Uh, that is particularly important for Iraq as summer temperature inside the cities frequently exceeded 50 Celsius in recent years. It can be also very effective for soil protection and stop the ongoing desertification. We have some reports showed that more than 85% of Iraq total area is, a, is a threatened by desertification. And on social level, we think large scale reforestation projects can support the local job creation and help slowing down the climate induced migration as deteriorating environmental systems is negatively impacting uh, people's livelihoods, especially in the Southern region of Iraq. Next. Uh, moving into the implementation, we need to address this proposal to the relevant government bodies, which can take care of the collection of these fees. Uh, the fees can be collected through different points, such as the petrol stations as fixed rate uh, per liter of fuel, or annual fees added to the driving license renewal, or as additional taxes imposed on the car dealers. Uh, we spent some time calculating the total amount required annually. Uh, in some projects around the world, uh, the reforestation cost averages $5 per ton, and hence the estimated cost to offset the annual CO2 emissions from cars in Iraq is about $50 million annually. And if you divide that uh, by the uh, number of cars, it equals $7 per car. Uh, of course, we can do more to improve this proposal. Uh, the cost uh, can vary from country to country, so we need to develop uh, appropriate cost model for reforestation projects in Iraq that can help us to estimate uh, the cost per ton of CO2 more accurately. Uh, and also we can uh, utilize the available GIS and the satellite data to make recommendations and identify the optimal locations for reforestation project. Uh, this is what we have prepared for you today. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Fantastic, thank you very much Wasim. Um, well, Sam, sorry. Um, we have a question ready straight in there. Sasha, over to you. Um, well, Sam, uh, many thanks for your presentation and for your indeed innovative, I would say, approach. You know, just this is something that I haven't heard before, you know, just of, um, of setting completely, you know, just the CO2 emissions, you know, just however, am I not, uh, you know, just I am not sure that you have calculated the offset of the CO2 emission only from the um, operation of the car, but however, there is still the production 
emission, the emission from the production, from the transportation of the car to the place where it's sold, and afterwards for the utilization of the, of the car as well. And uh, another issue is that I can clearly see that your project proposals are regarding the offsetting of the green greenhouse gas emissions from the cars. However, you know, just from the efficiency point of view, I would always, you know, just consider that the offsetting might be not the highest priority as a policy maker or as a decision makers. For me, it would be first, you know, just to reduce the number of the cars, you know, just on the street, to reduce, you know, just to increase the efficiency of those cars, you know, just to reduce the fuel consumption by the road transport, to use the public transport as much as possible. And only the remaining uh, the amount of the cars can be offset by the planting of the trees. But what I can see, you are immediately jumping on on the offsetting, you know, just without uh, tackling the problem of the increasing number of cars that you have identified in the first um, slide. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great questions. Now, uh, 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 to, to clarify what we did actually was from, we tried to be as practical as possible. And of course, in increasing the fossil fuel cars in Iraq is an issue. Uh, but uh, for the foreseeable future, we don't see really any solution. We don't have enough infrastructure to having public transportation system. Uh, the talk about any electric cars is nothing but a wishful thinking. Uh, we still burn a lot of gas. So we try to be as practical as possible to make something that can tangibly make a difference. And that is to really offset what we're having right now. Regardless of the source of the, of the CO2 emissions, so in Iraq, we have really two sources only. One is from the transportation. Uh, that we consume uh, the fossil fuel. And the second one is the flaring of the gas from the oil wells. And our proposal targets only the, uh, the one uh, produced by the consumption, especially inside the city. We think it can really make a tangible difference. Most of our cities or the green cover, at least inside the cities, have been destroyed. So that's why perhaps we have uh, exceeded 50 cylinders in summertime. Uh, the having a planting uh, trees inside the city will reduce this temperature by two or, or like three degrees at least. Uh, but to answer your questions, it's from a purely practical point uh, that we wanted to implement such a solution rather than just go for electric cars or reduce the numbers. We have a huge growth in the population. So this trend of the fossil fuel cars will just continue to, 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 to increase whether we like it or not. Fantastic. Um, yeah, sometimes I guess uh, the, the simplest ideas are the, the ones that are easiest to implement. Great. Thank you so much, Wasem, and to your team for that fantastic presentation. We will be on, uh, we'll, I'll be wrapping up now, but if you do have questions, try to get them in quickly and hopefully the team will do their best to answer them before we close. Um, so those are all of our presentations for today. Incredibly, um, we've managed to get through all of them. I want to say a massive thank you to all of the teams, um, in particular the presenters and the, the people answering the questions that we've seen today, but of course as well all of the other team members who are behind the scenes who've put in so much time and effort into coming up with these policies. Um, I'll take this time to say a massive thank you to our four judges who've really gone above and beyond with the level of scrutiny and engagement engagement in those policies and I think you've really challenged our teams to to consider um, where where else they could work on their policies so thank you so much for being such engaged um, judges today and thank you to all of our guests and attendees who've come on to engage and to support also incredible questions coming in the chat box so the next steps, the judges will um, come off this call and pick up another call where they will have the very challenging task of deliberating and deciding which of today's policies they would like to put forward to the grand final. You'll see on the screen that the grand final will be held next week, the 27th of October. So that will be the winning presentation from the four themes that we've seen, finance, collaboration, adaptation and mitigation. Um, the winner of the, that prize will then be, the winner of that, the whole competition will then be given their um, prize. The 
next event is available on the screen. If you'd like to attend, do get in touch. Um, we can share you the link for that. We'll also be sharing the recording from today's um, presentation, as well as information on and how you can access more information. And perhaps most importantly, we'll be letting you know who the winner of today's event is. Um, so without further ado, just a massive thank you very much for making this event such a success. And we look forward to seeing you next week on the 27th. Thanks. Bye.